Not as fun of an occasion as it usually is when we all get together, gentlemen. Obviously, uh, that is Ira Chaffel and Corey Clark. I'm Jeff Cameron. Just left the studio. We wanted to get together and discuss the uh, the career, the life, the legend that was uh, Mike Martin. Passed away earlier today. Certainly, our thoughts are with his family, friends, and those most affected by his passing. I think uh, you know everybody that considers themselves uh, a lifelong Seminole is uh, hurting a little bit today uh, when they heard the news that Mike Martin had passed away. But another way to look at it, guys, is what a life it was. Um, you know, we should all be so lucky as to have the family that he does and to have had the career that he did and to have affected as many people as he did. And that's what I kind of choose to think about today when I think about Mike Martin. Corey, uh, I was wondering, Corey, we just posted a column by Corey. He wrote it you know, recently um, reflecting on Coach Martin and uh, personally and also professionally. But, Corey, I don't know if you want to talk first since your column's up and people are reacting to that right now. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about it when I was writing it because it, you know, it kind of, there was parallels between that and Bowden. You know, I had to write the Bowden, you know, I, I didn't have to, but I wrote a Bowden, uh, essentially an obituary column about Bowden too. And Bowden meant a ton to me. Uh, I, I, I hope I expressed it well in that column, but I didn't know Bobby Bowden. Like I, I covered him for a couple of years at the end of his career, but I didn't know him. We weren't friends. We weren't friendly. He, I didn't have his phone number. Um, so it was different. My column about Bobby Bowden was about what those football teams and just his persona and personality meant to me and my dad and how that kind of connected me and my dad through my teenage years and on. Mike Martin, I knew. Like I got to know. And there's a story in the column, in my column, where you know he refers to me as his friend. Uh, and that took me aback. It still takes me aback talking about it because he didn't have to do that, but he was such a, he was such Jeff and you, heck you've been co going to games longer than any of us. That was not a put on persona. That was who he was. That's all always who he was. He was loud. He was gregarious. He had that great laugh and he was just a genuinely good human being above all else. And that's what should matter most with all of us. But he was a genuinely good human being and something, somebody I think like Bobby Bowden, I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know Bowden. I had a relationship with Mike Martin. Uh, but like Bobby Bowden, it's something that all Florida State fans can take pride in, that they're, the face of their program, the guy that built their program, was a genuinely good person. Yeah, and not, and not just him, but Carroll also, as Jeff mentioned, yeah. Carroll at the beginning. It felt like, you know, it was Mike Martin and Carroll, you know, and and, uh, and they really were, you know, just tremendous representatives of the university, obviously, but also, you know, great to all of us. Um you know, my first really encounter encounter was with Mike Martin was before I long before I covered Florida State, and I, it wasn't really even my encountering. Um, uh, a young reporter at at our school newspaper, the University of Florida, uh, Michelle was covering baseball for us, and at the time, uh, this is in ninety three, maybe ninety two, ninety three, and Florida's baseball coach was Joe Arnold, and his son Joe Jr. was playing for uh, who Jeff, you know him, um, Joe Joe Arnold Jr. was playing was playing at UF. He had transferred over to UF and Mike Martin senior and Mike Martin junior were at Florida state. So you had the both, uh, the dads coaching the teams and their sons were on the teams and she wanted to do an article on it. So she reached out to Mike Martin, you know, through FSU and they, and she, when she got off the phone with, she was on the phone with Mike Martin senior and, and meet Mike Martin junior. And, uh, she just like was glowing. She just was, she just kept, she's like, that was unbelievable. She's, <laughs> uh, she's like, I've never talked to anybody like that. But she just couldn't stop talking about Mike Martin Sr., how sweet he was to her. And this is a girl who's covering UF, right. but wants to do this story. And he just was and, – and I remember that making an impact on me because just how sweet he was to her. And, and me, it was great to her too. And it was, turned out to be a really cool story. Um, but then – and then when I was in Thomasville, my next thing before I ever covered Florida State was he, he used to host an FCA uh, golf tournament up mm -hmm. in Thomasville. And he did a. Th he would basically play the same hole all day. And they had a thing where, like, if you could beat Mike Martin to the pin, and so yeah. he would just play that ninth hole or eleventh hole, whatever, whichever one it was, it was par three. He would just play that all day. So I thought it would be cool to kind of just hang out with him for a little while at that hole and watch him interact with people. I ended up staying out there the whole time he was out there, the whole four or five hours, because it was just fun to watch how he impacted these people who came through and played that hole with him and how funny he was and how self-deprecating he was. And, and it was just, it was, it was a cool experience. And then I, again, at the time I never knew that, you know, in the, around 2000 or 2002, I would get to cover his last 
you know, 15, 20 years. So it was, uh, uh, you know, really just uh, that story that Corey shared about Brady and, and that experience. I just think everybody, there's got to be mil- a million of those stories. I was just thinking that that is another uh, measure of the man uh, is that there are countless stories like that. Um, I drove down to Tampa when Jameis was on the team uh, at Florida State playing baseball, and I drove down with Mike Martin Jr. Uh, and his his two boys, and then also my son Bryce. And Bryce was little, and he was just getting to an age where he loved, you know, he's starting to like to watch baseball. And and I had taken him over to Hauser before, and and he loved getting hot dogs and watching baseball with me. And I beforehand, because we were there early, it was an exhibition game at Legend Field in Tampa. Uh, they were going to play the Yankees, um, and we because we got there early. I had Bryce with me, and uh, me told me walk in through the clubhouse, and you know you can see my dad. And I walked in there, and I introduced him to to Bryce, and he walked out to the dugout with Bryce, and I was like, "Can I get a picture?" And I felt awkward because at this point, I've talked to Mike Martin a ton and covered baseball and all that, but I didn't want him to think that he owed anything. But he well, did it you all. Were calling, you were calling for his job back then. Oh, the crazy thing is, by the way, to speak to his class. I no, mean, absolutely. Very, yeah, to, at various points, I had called for his, not necessarily called for his job, but there had been moments Shit, where yeah. I thought that they needed to move on, and certainly that was kind of later in his career. He knew all of that. He never once said anything cr- uh, cross to me or anything like that. He was always, hey, you got a job to do, and, and you should do it, and if we're not playing well, you better tell people we're not playing well. Yeah, I, I, that's what you can ask for. But that, but that, that, that's an aside. I, yeah, he just picked up Bryce and put him on his lap. I have the picture. I was looking at it earlier on my phone when I heard that he had passed. It's a great picture. It's Bryce smiling ear to ear and Mike Martin holding him on his knee in the dugout at Legends Field, smiling back. And it was so genuine. He was so happy to be, you know, around this kid who was falling in love with baseball. And what and I he, think he makes what makes Eleven special, what made him special, what makes him special is that. He he was he you you had that Bryce had that chance opportunity because of who his dad was. But if you weren't Jeff Cameron, right? And if if Bryce had just seen him outside of Dick Hauser Stadium on a random Tuesday after a game or after a practice, he would treat him the exact same way, no matter who his dad was or who his family was. He just he always had time for people. He was even after horrible losses. Tough losses, yeah. Tough, tough losses. He had time, and he was always just so gracious. But he was so gracious with his time in just 30 seconds here, a minute here, just always so seemingly so appreciative of people, the the people that were there talking to him and interacting with him. The thing, uh, somebody told me this story, and I, and I hate that I can't remember who told me the story. And I apologize if, they're, if they end up watching this, but I remember somebody telling me a long time ago that they had a family member in the hospital and that they were – um, in the hospital with their family member, and they watched Mike Martin going into patients' rooms, um, and basically just being there. Like for people that some of the people, I think what happened was maybe somebody said, "Hey, it would mean a lot if you came in and talked to this patient." And then he apparently spent a lot of time with patients who were really sick in the hospital. Again, not announced, not for media, just a good person. And, and when Corey was mentioning coach Bowden at the beginning of this, I mean, it's just how lucky Florida state fans have been. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, and, and, you know, as fans and Jeff, you touched on it, you know, we were critical of coach Bowden at times. We were critical of Mike Martin senior at times. Um, But just how lucky this school and this fan base has have to have two people like that. I mean, and there's several others. I mean, you can go on the list. I mean, coach Sue, and there's been a lot of great, uh, awesome Leonard Hamilton, great people. Yeah awesome people that have been affiliated with Florida state athletics, but these two giants of the sport at at one time or another had the most wins in their sports history and also just unbelievable representatives of the school. It's just, um, it's remarkable. It should be pointed out too, over the years, you know, we all, we all know that the the detractors of Mike Martin would certainly note that he, he didn't win the national championship. And the thing is, he won everything else there was to win. And I remember one day, many years ago, Corey, you and I talked about this, and I brought it up on a show a time or two, what would have changed if in 2004 Mike Martin won the World Series or in 1997 Mike Martin had won the World Series so that you couldn't say that anymore? I mean, you know what I mean? Like that, people use that, but in in reality, 
had he won it in the early 90s and then didn't from 92 to where we are now, people would still be like, well, he only won the one. You know, it was such a silly thing. What he yeah. did do was guarantee for the better part of his career uh, at least 40 wins every year and that they were going to go and play really meaningful postseason baseball. That's what he did. Yeah, um, and, you know, me as a Braves fan, I could always relate to that because they they did get their one. They they went to the postseason 14 years. They won it in 1995. At the end of Bobby Cox's career, that was that they weren't people being like, "Hey, give him a break." He won it in 1995. Right. Like it's like he only won one out of 14, or only two. If it had been two, or if it had been three out of 40, that was always it. It would have been it would have been awesome for him. It would have been awesome for that program because that's the only thing that was missing. And uh, but man. What what always what bothered me and still bothers me. I don't you don't hear it as much anymore because he hadn't coached in five years. But that he wasn't a winner, and it's like, buddy, oh, miss me with that. He is the all time winner. Yes, he's he got unlucky in the postseason a few times and made some bad decisions in the post time the postseason a few times. But when you win forty games for forty years. When you make the NCAA tournament every year, and when you make Omaha 18 times or whatever it was, you are winning a lot of important games. You are winning a ton of important games, and he did that. He was a winner. That did not define him. It was never going to define him if he'd have won 11 national championships. What defined him is all the other stuff we've been talking about. But on the field accomplishments, by God, there, there's other than that one thing, there's nobody that's accomplished more no. than that guy. He won a thousand games twice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm glad that recently, sorry, some of it had to happen at the expense of both your teams. My team's never in it. So I don't have to worry about that, but people, I used to say for years, you do understand that baseball is the most fickle of the mistresses. Yes. Like it is, you can win a hundred games. And by definition, if you do in a 162 game season, you're an amazing team. You could get swept in the first round. It happens. Baseball's weird. We've had teams win 110 plus games in Major League Baseball and get swept in the first yeah. round. We've had, it, it happens. So unfortunately, it happened to him, but it certainly didn't define him. But what I would point out is that for somebody who desperately wanted to win that game and came up just short in his career of doing so, I never once heard him become petty. Yeah. or to become distasteful in a post-game press conference, no matter how bitter the disappointment. He handled all of the winning and the bitter disappointments with class. And that that is important. That that marks who he is. That's somebody that we'll remember for having done that, in addition to all the great stories off the field of baseball. Do you guys think, and again, not winning the national championship, as you said, it it, it – it's a, it's a, it's something missing. There's, there's something missing there from the legacy to some degree, at least on paper. But that stretch in the '90s, um, that to me, Florida State baseball in the '90s was as like oh, yeah. powerful, was as powerful and as magical. The whole scene. And again, I came here the first when I was working in Thomasville. I got there in uh, spring of '94, and I think it was '94 that I came down. I think it was, yeah, I think it was spring, summer 94 for a regional. I came down to cover it for the Thomasville paper and uh, Jonathan Johnson was pitching. And I mean, that team was just yeah. ridiculous. And I remember seeing the animals and Mongo and the crowd and the, the, the electricity and how talented that team, that team was. I, I think that stretch is as powerful as anything in any sport of college in college sports. Like that run for Florida state baseball to me. And you think about all the guys that have been in the major leagues um, from that time period, from I guess the mid, mid to late eighties through 2000, early two thousands, it's probably as powerful as any, as any stretch in any college sports. Part. I mean, it's up there with Duke basketball, Florida state football. I mean, it's, it's, it was incredible. And I think what baseball, as Jeff was alluding to, it's so much about consistency. That's that's the sport. Right. He, in to, to be consistent through seventy games, to be consistent through forty years, and they had ups and well, I wouldn't even want to say downs. They had ups and dips, but never downs. I mean, they always made the NCAA tournament. His worst team was his last team, and they went to Omaha. Like you know what I mean? Like he he, they never were down. They all they would dip a little bit. But I think that's what I value most, especially when I got into it. Like when I when I got here and started covering the program, 
that because you saw all these other great programs, once great programs that would really stumble. You've seen it here at Florida State since he left. Um, you know, they, they would stumble a little bit for him to be that good for that long to have those. That is not normal. That is not. Hey, you're just at Florida State. You've got these built in advantages. No, that's not true. There's a lot of teams in California that have sunshine and good players. They didn't do this. The other two teams in the state, while they've won national championships, had plenty of downtimes, uh, especially Florida there for a long time. I just think that should always be celebrated uh, with Mike Martin. It's just the overall consistency. And I wonder if that comes back to who he is as a person. Like he didn't re like you were talking about, Jeff. He never really seemed. I know he was an absolute competitor, a, the fiercest of competitors. But he was still who he was at the end of the day. He never let that change him. And I think that's why his teams were always so consistently good was because he was so consistent. He was always the, the, he seemed like the same guy. And the I think the competitive part is such a big part of it. Because, I mean, he, I mean, like you guys said, there was the image of him in his later years as grandfatherly and all that. But man. Fiercely competitive. I mean, good yeah. grief. I mean, as competitive as anybody. Well, and really talented too. Uh, the eye hand coordination that it, it, it's funny, his son has it too. Uh, those guys, I mean, he was a good golfer back in the day as, as well. And he loved that sport. I had many conversations with him about golf and he would crack me up because you could see it even in just the way he would tell a story. Um, you could picture playing. I never had the good fortune of playing with him. I've been on a golf course at the same time he was, but I never played with him in his group. But uh, Trey Jones is a good friend of mine, the golf coach at Florida state. And, and by the way, through golf, you get a lot of these stories, too, about Mike Martin, because that was his other passion. And when I first got to know Trey, and I don't think he would mind me saying this, he told me that Mike Martin was his mentor because when he arrived at Florida State, he didn't know anybody. You know, he he, he didn't go to school here. He was coming over and, and had coached at uh, Georgia State, I believe it was. And then he comes in and uh, he said that Mike Martin was the first one to come over to him and say, if you ever need anything, you know, my office is always open. Come on in and talk to me. And Trey said when he had trouble reconciling his growing family with having to be on the road to recruit, the guy that he went and spoke to was Mike Martin. He said, how do you do it? How do you do, how do you prioritize your passion with this job, but also uh, your role as a father and your role as a husband? And he said he and Mike talked about that in his office for like two, three hours about the ways that you go about doing that. I mean, that's just a little insight into who he was to other coaches in other sports over at Florida State and also the ways that he spoke to so many people. And it wasn't just about baseball. It was about being uh, a good person, about being a good dad or a good husband, and, and, and then also being passionate and hardworking in the field that you're in. So, yeah, it was the complete package there. And it never it, it was never lost on me that, you know, after those tough losses, the ones that you know ate at him, um, that he never really lost composure by tough questions or having to deal with it. Never, I never saw that. And I and I remember one thing, a scene that just popped into my mind as we were talking. I saw a a, a comment about Florida State. How lucky! I can't remember who posted the comment a few minutes ago about yeah, I've been so lucky to have classy legends. Lanny Day posted that um, because it, you are. I mean, the fact that you had Bowden and Martin running simultaneously mm -hmm. for two decades with each other or th three decades almost is incredible. Um, but also, like I remember after Florida State that crazy run in nineteen. Uh, where they somehow beat Georgia twice in Athens by like they looked like the the what the ninety six Yankees. Um, so they after the game he's doing press conference and this and it's just it's in the bowels of the stadium and he's waiting to do his press conference because the Georgia coach is wrapping up and one of the Georgia players comes up stands up next to him kind of sheepishly and then after me and me and eleven are talking about something probably the game or I'm probably saying something smart ass to him and sarcastic and. The guy says, hey, I, I hate to interrupt. Uh, Coach Martin, I just wanted to say I'm such a big fan of yours. Uh, you mean so much to me and so much to the sport of baseball. It's a Georgia player whose season just ended <laughs> going up to Mike Martin. And I wish I could remember who the player was. I looked up his number and I just can't I can't remember now going up and saying that to him. And when he walked away, 11, like some coaches would be like, just go back to the conversation. Eleven seemed genuinely touched. Like can, mm -hmm. he even said, "Like, can you believe he just did that? Wasn't that something?" Like he it meant something to him. It, yeah. It's like he all. What made him even more likable is it's almost like he was sheepish about his place in the game. Like he didn't want to own it. He was just a normal dude that happened to win a lot of games, and he always gave credit to everybody else. But that moment with the way that kid was so nervous to talk to the coach that just beat him 
will always stand out to me and what in how lucky how great he was as a coach, but how lucky, a, you know, if he was, I'm not trying to take shots here, but if he was a coach at maybe the, if he was the coach at Florida right now, I don't think Kevin O'Sullivan in 20 years <laughs> is going to have guys coming up to him and say, Hey coach, so Sully, it's just been a pleasure what watching you. What gives you that idea, Corey? <laughs> right. I, I just think the fact that he was such a good coach, but such a genuine, genuinely good person to root for. Well, is, yeah, what, and is the, why a Georgia player would come up to him and say something like that. Right. And the respect throughout the sport and, right. and from, from media and other coaches. And it, it was always a reminder to, again, we covered him day to day for so long that he, yeah. he feels like just, you know, uh, there's 11 and you, you just talk to him. Like, for sure. Right. But every year when they would host a regional or a super, usually the regionals, cause you have three other coaches come in and I would always sit there in those press conferences and be kind of reminded of his greatness in the sport by the way those other coaches would look at him, talk to him, the way if you before or after the press conference when he would just go over and shoot the bowl with them, the way they looked at him. And these are, I mean, other legitimate yeah. and <laughs> successful yeah. college yeah. coaches, but they all looked at him a different way. That reverence was really cool. And it was a good reminder, I think, for some of us who got used to him. They did that, by the way, in Baton Rouge after we won the re- after Florida State won the regional in Baton Rouge to go to the college world series. And, uh, I, I was at that series and, and that was a lot of fun to, to be there and cover that. But I, I was struck by a couple of things, uh, right after they won in extra innings. Uh, and, and I, I described this on the air today. Uh, I have video. I'll, I'll cherish this. I have video. I was standing as a fan and, and I'm filming the final at bat that what ended up being the game winning hit. And I watched Mike Martin jr along with the team run out onto the field. And then junior remembered his dad was in the dugout and turned around and walked back calmly and looked him in the eye and shook his hand. And it was this cool moment that I have on video. I sent it to him later on, but what happened just after that is also awesome. And that is the way that the LSU coaching staff went over to 11 and the way that the LSU fans went down and said to him, go get it, go win it. And I'm walking out of the stadium after witnessing that, and because I had gone as a fan for that particular game, I had a Florida State shirt on. And this FSU fan, I mean, this LSU fan comes walking over and he goes, well, if we had to lose to somebody. I'm glad it was y'all. I just hope he wins it this time. I want him to win it so bad. I just thought that was so cool. Yeah. That's it. I mean, obviously, LSU's got, what, seven of these things <laughs> now. Right. But but how cool is it that guy just walking over? And that, and that was not like a, an outlier. Like a lot of their fans were having that conversation. Well, if we had to lose, you know, at least it was to 11. And it's That's not patronizing. It's not patronizing. No. It's like legitimately those fans are crazy. LSU baseball fans are probably the best in the sport. Yeah. They know the sport. They understand the sport. And they wanted it for 11 just like everybody did. And I Look, I know it didn't end. It's not – man, life isn't movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. They don't They don't end with you always on top. It's not always Rocky. Well, Rocky, I guess, lost. Uh, Rocky two. It's not always Rocky two <laughs> when you finally get the crown. They don't always end that way. But uh, and spoiler alert, folks, if you haven't seen Rocky, he loses. They they give Apollo Creed the decision. But it, it's it's almost like it did. It just didn't. The fact that he got out there with that team was such a special run that was just out of complete nowhere. They were like the last team to be selected in the tournament. They might have only been selected because it was his last year. <laughs> and then they go and beat two straight top eight teams yeah. on the on road, road, big SEC team. It was just remarkable. And with, that was with, what a neat way for him to finish his uh, baseball career. Yeah, with like a club baseball team member that they re- recruited over. Yeah, you know, Tim delivered. Becker. Tim Becker hitting <laughs> bombs against first-round picks. It was like, this is magical. Out of a movie. Um, one story I wanted to share real quick, just, and this is not from the media perspective, but again, just to, the way he respected so many different people. Um, I always thought it was neat. That um, and Steve Ellis, may he rest in peace, yeah. who worked at the Democrat for 20 something years, um, was kind of a mentor to Corey and, and somebody I, I was more of a adversary with, rival with. I, I never worked with Steve, I always worked at, competing with Steve, and Steve was a, a fierce competitor too. Yeah. But what I always thought was cool about uh, Martin was Steve a lot of times would, would he try to be he'd try to file his story up in the press box and then come down to the interviews. A lot of times he'd be late, like he'd be we'd be waiting on Steve, but man, Mike Martin would not start without Steve Ellis. He would not start without Steve Ellis. And it would be kind of frustrating for, you know, again, like I'm working at, you know, on the website and I'm like, Hey, let's go, you know? And and he's like, no, we'll we'll just wait for Steve. Well, 
one of the things that, um, you know, one of Mike Martin's close, maybe his closest friend, Mike Martin senior's closest friend probably is Bill Smith at Capital City Bank. And, and, uh, when I came over to the Democrat, um, not long after Steve passed, uh, they have a Bill Smith hosts the baseball team for a yes. preseason dinner. And, uh, and Steve was always invited. And I don't even know if Steve went or not um, all the time. I think he did. Um, but when then when I came over there and then when Corey came over there, like, you know, the, the Smiths would invite us to this preseason dinner as well. And um, and I I felt weird about it. You know, like you'd feel weird. I mean, like you. It uh, is kind of odd. I, yeah. you've, you've gone. I mean, it just feels it felt weird maybe because, you know, it's just not what we do. We don't really mingle. As Corey said earlier, we don't really mingle with the people we cover. But I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I mean, I, you know, we got along so well with Mike Martin Jr. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go over there. And he just, could, Mike Martin Sr. could not have been more gracious. And, and it, but it was the respect for the newspaper. You know, I think it was like, it was, it was, mm-hmm. and, you know, they weren't going to stop it just because Steve wasn't there anymore. Um, and then, you know, I just felt like the whole time, you know, that relationship and the way he treated the media, even when, and he got negative, Mike Martin and Steve Ellis was critical of Mike Martin senior at times. And, and just, there was part always, it. it was just that, that, that part of it, again, it's, it's fans, the fans are more important than the media. I'm just trying to share something that, you know, the fans probably wouldn't see um, that part of it as well. Yeah. It, well, listen, my first boss was Lee Bowen, who was the play-by-play announcer for Florida state baseball. The first coach I met at Florida state upon getting the job was Mike Martin. It wasn't Bobby Bowden. It wasn't Pat Kennedy. It was, it was, you know, it was Mike Martin. And it's because Lee hired me to do the morning show and we would talk Florida state baseball incessantly because it was his passion and my passion. And Lee happened to be from Pittsburgh. So he was a huge pirates fan, just like I am. So we had that in common. But we would debate all the things like uh, that were good and, and, the, and the mistakes and all this. And he's like, well, listen, by the way, tomorrow I'm taking you over with me before the baseball season gets started. I want you to meet Mike Martin since you're going to be talking about him on the air. And I said, OK. And he's like, he'll give us an overview of the team before the season starts. And he's really gracious with his time. Well, I was scared to death, guys. I had yeah. never I did. I mean, I was nervous, nervous. I I. I'd been a host at You're 12, 20, 23 years old, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I, I, I had so never much hair, you had hair before. down to your shoulders. Probably. I had thick, lovely, wavy locks. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was crazy. Didn't even I, fit in a cap. Yeah. Um, and so I remember going over there with him and sitting down and walking in a room and he was larger than life. And I, I was nervous again, and he made me feel so at ease. And again, it's not about me. It's who he was. It was just cool as hell. I walk in, I'm stutter effing my way through whatever these questions were. I didn't know anything about the team in the way that I should. Um, and then I, then I wanted to because of the way that he sat there and talked about them and the hard work and what he thought they were going to be and what they could be by season's end. And we walked out of there with a treasure trove of information. And I thought, well, I I guess that's the way everybody is. I mean, like if this is going to be the coolest job in the world, I can just go talk to a coach for an hour and a half. And he's going to tell me about every position starter and backup from a guy he's never met. I found out that's not the way everybody is. (laughs) Yeah, He's different. (laughs) One of one, but he did it. And it was cool. That was my first experience. And, I always felt at ease after that with him. I could just call him and ask him anything. I remember after the huge controversy down in Miami where they were caught stealing signs and they're on the walkie talkie and they're like, you know, curveball, curveball and all that. And they busted him on that. And that was an ugly deal there. He walked across the diamond, was screaming. And I remember thinking, well, this is going to be a fun conversation. And I talked to him. He was only talked to me off the record about that. And he was like, look, I don't want to make this about us. And I don't want to draw it. And he goes, I, I don't think the kids did anything wrong over there at Miami. I, it's the coach that I'm mad at, and he knows better than that. And he sat and explained everything to me, and it was like, here's what you can say, but I don't want you talking about this and this because, again, I don't want this to be about me or about the, the kids that you know are on that Miami team. I thought it was fascinating, but he would do that with you. If you if you engaged him and had any idea what you were talking about, he would he would sit and talk with you for a long time about every aspect. There's Scott Setch, former player. Mm-hmm. Former there he is. Yeah, I remember, I remember watching him play. Um, thanks. For, uh, one one more thing on that, and I think Corey might have touched on his column. I can't remember, but the way after how many times Corey after press like when we would interview him in the dugout after a win, his first question when we were done was like, "What some was what's going on with basketball? Like, yeah. what's going yeah. on with the FSU basketball team, or maybe North when? Carolina or Duke's playing somebody?" But usually, FSU basketball might have been playing at the same time, maybe on the road, and he would always that was like his first question was, you know, I, "Anybody I got think- the score?" That's what I wanted to try to get in my uh, convey in my column is that he was not 
well, clearly he wasn't a mercenary. He was at Florida State for over 40 years, and he grew, he went to school here. But he was not just a guy that was interested in his own sport and couldn't name. He was, you know, I remember specifically the best times were after or before a practice on like a Wednesday, interviewing him for the upcoming series in the basketball team, men's or women, had played the night before. And he's talking about a specific possession in the game. Right. And like I – I can't believe how good Tony Douglas is, or I can't believe Lawson hit that three. Like, and he's yeah. Mike Martin, and he's he's so invested. He was such a fan yeah. of Florida State. You know, I saw him. Mm-hmm. I've been to, I think I've probably been to four college golf tournaments tournaments in my life, and I saw him at three of them. Yeah, um, you know, he he was just a fan. Obviously, he's a fan of golf, but he was a fan of Florida State athletics, like real. Like it hurt him. It hurt him when the basketball team would lose in the NCAA tournament. It really hurt him, and it hurt him when the football team would lose. And it, and he was very, very excited uh, when they won. It was just that's that's what I don't want to get lost is, like, that guy was a true Seminole. Like, he went to school there in, what, the 60s? He was an assistant coach for Dick Hauser, and then he coached for 40 years. It, it just this – he's synonymous with Florida State baseball, but he's really kind of synonymous with the university. Because he was there for so long, and he was he was so well. I mean, he was just he he loved that he loved that he loved the university with all his heart, and you could see it every time he talked about. It. And that's what I said in the column is he always talked about how lucky he was to be the coach at Florida State, and it's like, no, nah, man, it's kind of the other way around. They were incredibly lucky to find you in whatever it was nineteen eighty for probably paying them $25,000 a year, $19,000 a year, and then you have that run of success for four decades where they don't ever have to think about making a change, ever. Yeah, I remember he he wouldn't get gas in Gainesville because he didn't want to add to the economy. He he hated hated the University of Florida, hated him. And I remember Tyler Holt. uh, Tyler Holt had a really good first weekend as a college baseball player. He had a lot of good weekends. He had a lot of good weekends, yeah. But his very first weekend as a freshman, it might have been, though, I think as a freshman on that 08 team, mm-hmm. I was talking to him afterwards, like, man, it looks like you got a pretty good leadoff hitter, huh? And you got him for the next two and a half years. And he goes, the best thing, Corey, I got him from Gainesville. <laughs> got him from Gainesville. And I'm like, yeah, yeah man, you, that hate was real for that university. Oh, and I wanted to say this one other thing, because you were talking about how he wouldn't bring up the Jim Morris Miami thing on the air. I don't think I've been, I don't, he's, he might not have ever been madder other than that moment. Yeah. When the NC State coach, Elliot Avent, uh, said, basically called James Ramsey a dirty player for a slide at home plate in the ACC tournament, when it was clearly the catcher's fault for getting in the way, Ramsey was just trying to get to the plate. Avent lost his mind, thought he was dirty, thought he should have been thrown out. And Mike Martin was, in, because James Ramsey's not a dirty player, and but he, he, he would never engage in that kind of stuff, ever. Mm-hmm. He would tell you, he talked to you a little bit off the record about Off the it, record, even, he talked to you. But yeah. even then, he kind of didn't want to get too into criticizing people. He just hate, even if somebody was critical of him or his program, he really, really, maybe the players, Scott Zetch would probably think differently, but he probably <laughs> criticized players every now and again. But people, other people, media members or other coaches, other teams, that he just, a, a guy that was a showboat on the mound, he very, very, very rarely criticized people because it wasn't like gentlemanly. And he was a gentleman. Uh, I think the the best part of something like this on a sad day when somebody who uh, everybody loves and 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 had an experience with in some way or another, um, you know, when, when you lose somebody like that, it's a sad day. But it's also an awesome thing to hear so many people have stories like this or to weigh in on the chat yeah. or to, on the message boards or in email. I've already received countless texts. I was able to talk to Eric Llewellyn earlier today on the show. We're talking about it now. You're going to see in the next 48, 72 hours and over the course of this upcoming baseball season – you're going to see a lot of uh, moments in which people dedicate things to Mike Martin, rightfully so. But then you're in turn going to hear a ton of stories that nobody knew about. And yeah. They're all very similar. They're they're of a kind person doing a kind thing when the cameras aren't around. Right. And that's very cool. Uh, I, I, I love even, that aspect. Yeah. And even, you know, and again, we got to touch on, you know, the, the way, you know, things ended with meet as head coach. Um, you know, obviously it was a really difficult situation and, 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 you know, Mike Martin Jr. takes over as head coach, doesn't have as much success, doesn't probably get as much time as he's thinking he's going to get. And uh, that was a difficult situation for the university to handle. I thought it was really important that, you know, the Martins were able to come back. Mike Martin Sr. and Carroll came back. 
um, when they had the ceremony, uh, you know, after Link got hired and I know Buster, Link is right. They were there for Buster's, they were for Buster's yeah, right? retirement Jersey yeah. and uh, Jersey retirement and Link. Um, I know it's spent a lot of Link, you know, obviously thinks the world of them and so many of the former players and those relationships, that was such a difficult time for the baseball community because you had, uh, you know, obviously the world of respect for, for the family and what they did, Mike Martin Jr., what he did for 20 years as an assistant coach mm-hmm. and what, uh, you know, and Carol meant to the program and all the whole family son played uh, the program. Both sons were in the dugout all the time. It was just, you know, it was the Martin's family kind of program for a long time and then it ended the way it ended. And that was so difficult for so many people. Um, I'm glad that there felt like there was some peace at the end. It felt like it, it was good to see uh, Levin back out there. He came came to several games uh, when Link became head coach, which was really cool because you wondered if he'd ever st- – I, I wondered when Mike Martin Jr. got let go, I didn't know if Mike Martin Sr. would ever come in that stadium again. And I was really – it meant a lot that they were able to do that and, and kind of, you know, as, as well as they could kind of mend those fences because um, – and then, you know, similar to Coach Bowden, they were able to get Coach Bowden back for some events when for a while it looked like that, that may never happen. And what's cool about uh, what's cool about Link having the job, obviously Mike Martin Sr. would have wanted his son to be the head coach for 40 years too, and it, it worked out the way it worked out. But Link is a child of Florida State baseball too. Like he is, he is not Mike Martin's child, obviously, but he grew up with Mike Martin's teams. He's been, yeah. He was a Tallahassee kid. He was climbing the fence, watching games back in the 80s, and then he was a starting shortstop for four years. So it's still Mike Martin's tentacles are still all over this program because one of his guys, a starting shortstop for four years, Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's had more than one of those, a starting shortstop for four years um, is the head coach now. So it's still Mike, it it still feels like Mike Martin is connected to this program in a really big way because of his connections with Link. He always will be. um, Yeah, absolutely. And and certainly anytime you walk through the gates at Dick Houser Stadium, you see Mike Martin Field, and that will never change. And I think that's a, a good place for us to wrap it up and note that uh, obviously we're, again, uh, our thoughts are, are with those in the family, the Martin family, and those closest to him that are hurting today. Uh, but we did think we should get on and share some stories and talk about the man that we knew. Um, rest in peace to Mike Martin. Ira, Corey, I'm Jeff, and uh, you guys, uh, we appreciate you joining us for this on a a tough day, but uh, a day where we can finally remember a great man. Rest in peace, Mike Martin.